Hey, what up YouTube? It's the Dungeon Master, back with another video. This week I'm going to show you this really awesome terrain piece that I made. A grassland feature with some hills and a rope bridge in the middle. Stick around and we'll show you how I made it. Okay, so the first thing that I did, I went and cut myself a piece of MDF, roughly uh, 16 by 8, so twice as long as it is wide, and um, beveled the edges. I just used my uh, belt sander, but you can use a Dremel, you can use a rasp, you can use whatever you want. You can do all of this with hand tools. You don't need to use power tools. I just happen to have power tools, and that makes it go by a little faster. So, um, knocking off all the dust on here, and what I've got some is uh, some Rust-Oleum paint and primer in one. This is just a espresso, it's brown. This is what I use for my base coat when I usually do my, my uh, MDF bases. So I'm going to just use some of this to coat this and we'll start there and then we'll build on top of it. While we're waiting for the base to dry, I'm going to cut up some pieces of insulation foam that we're going to use to mold our hills out of uh, for connecting the, the two sections of bridge. So I've got a piece here that looks about a good size for each hill. It's shorter than half of my base and it's thinner than the width of the base, which is what I'm looking for. So I'm going to use this as my template. So I'm going to just use my craft knife here and my T-square to make these cuts. I don't want each hill to be the same, so I'm piecing together my pe uh, putting together my pieces here to try to create uh, something a little bit to create some variation. I do want them to be the same height, so I need another piece. All right, so now is the time when I'm going to try an experiment. I want to try to use this glue to hold this together. Now, I know this isn't going to melt the foam uh, egregiously. It's not going to tear it to shreds. It's not going to, you know, melt through it like alien blood. So I'm going to attempt to glue these sections together with this glue. Also, this glue dries really fast, like 20 minutes this stuff dries. So I'm gonna be able to have a decent coverage on my foam here and not worry so much about it coming apart on me while I'm building this thing. This does eat foam. It just doesn't eat it a lot. I'm choosing to use this glue this time because I wanna see if it will hold up better than the hot glue be a little less messy. And I'm just kind of sliding it back and forth with a little pressure here to make sure it's making a complete bond. If you feel free to use whatever kind of glue you want with this too. If you want to use PVA glue, use PVA glue. I mean PVA glue works fine, it just takes longer to cure because the oxygen can't reach the center. Uh, of the pieces, so it takes a little bit longer. Oop, I split my tube open, so I'm getting glue all over myself.
Okay, so in my usual efforts to save time and cut corners, I didn't really wait long enough for this to cure and it's not really sticking for me. So I'm going to have to bite the bullet and hit it with some hot glue. Also, this is what it looks like on the inside afterwards. So it eats the foam a lot more than I thought it would. When I did the Dragon's Lair, I painted it on, uh, or I put it on uh, foam that was covered with paint. So it didn't have a chance to ruin it like this. So I'm going to have to uh, hot glue this together in order to keep it from sliding apart. That's just the way it is. I thought it would work and it didn't. So on to plan B. So I'm gonna have to use my Proxon to finish these up. I gotta cut them down a little bit smaller. I made them a little bit too large. They're going to take up way too much space on the, uh, the base that I had planned to use. So, and they're, they're gonna be, they're gonna end up being way too uh, tight where I want it to be. So I'm gonna cut these down a little bit using my Proxon, process them down a little bit further, get them all cut up and stuff and We'll move on. It's the nature of it, I guess. You try, you fail. You try, you fail. You have an idea, you think it'll work. It doesn't work, you try again. It's the nature of the craft, I suppose. I'll get to it, and we'll move forward. Okay, uh, now that I've got these cut down to a size and roughly a shape that is uh, aesthetically pleasing, I'm gonna go back in with my hobby knives a little bit, do a little bit more uh, trimming. I'm trying to go for a kind of a staircase that wraps around here to give something, you know, that for the miniatures to get up on so that this, can, this piece of terrain can be usable uh, in that regard. Um, so I'm gonna try to do something similar over here too so that there's two kind of ways to get up, maybe one going this way, one going this way. So I'm gonna just kind of hack and chop at these a little bit more until I get what I'm looking for. Okay, I got uh, a rough shape uh, that I want with these, and now I'm going to glue them to my MDF board, and then I'm gonna texture them using some drywall uh, joint compound, which doesn't take very long to dry, and it will fill in these holes where the glue had uh, melted away the, um, the foam. So I'm just gonna hit this the bottom of these with a generous amount of hot glue. Okay, so to fill the larger gaps here, I'm going to use some 
spackle, which is a little bit different than the drywall compound. This stuff dries to almost a sponge-like consistency and is better for filling the voids. So I'm gonna use this first and then I'm gonna go over the top of the whole thing using the, uh, the joint compound. And I'm just gonna press this into all of the gaps to try to fill it in. Okay, now we have to wait uh, about an hour or two for this to dry, and once it's dry, then we can come in and do the same thing, but with the spackle. Or not the spackle, I'm sorry. We can come in and we can do the same thing with the joint compound and give it a uh, better uh, texture. All right, so I applied the spackle a little thicker, um, so it's gonna take a little bit longer to dry. So while it's doing that, uh, most likely to overnight, because now the day is starting to wear on, I'm going to, um, start working on the bridge and I'm going to take my uh, I'm gonna to start to do that with my craft string now I measured the a reasonable distance between the two parts uh, the two hills and uh, I came up with a measurement of six and a half inches roughly that I need the span to cover but I wanted to have a bow so I need to come up with a little bit longer than six and a half inches so I'm gonna measure the six and a half. All right, so that's our six and a half, but we want a good bow to it. So that's that. Then we need some to tie it with. So I'm gonna add two inches per side. So that brings us to eight and a half, ten and a half. Grand total of 11 inches. I'm just gonna go ahead and round it up to a foot. So we need two foot long lengths of craft string to do this. All right, now I'm not gonna be doing railings on this bridge or anything like that. That's gonna take way too much work and it's going to uh, possibly make it a little bit more difficult to move the miniatures around. It might add stability or whatever, but I don't really care. Um, I'm gonna do it this way because I feel like this is the way to do it. Now what I need to do is I need to cut a ton of wooden planks and to do that we need the good old balsa slicer. Alright, so you guys have seen this before. I've used this uh, homemade piece of equipment on the channel before. It's just a lever with a uh, razor blade screwed into it. So I'm going to measure out, I think I want to make them a little bit wider than the base of a mini to give them a little bit of overhang. I'm gonna go about an inch and a quarter for each plank. And then I'm just going to chop a bunch of them. So to make this quick, I'm going to cut off a small piece here, piece of double-sided tape. Put this on my inch and a quarter mark. And then stick my piece of wood to it little block that I cut here. 
And now I don't have to worry about measuring it exactly. I can just chop. And process down this balsa wood really quickly. Now I want to roughen these up a little bit. They shouldn't look like new boards. So I'm gonna attack them uh, violently. <laughs> I'm gonna attack them violently using my X-Acto knife. Uh, just the edges to make them kind of a little bit rougher. And I'm just gonna chop them up like this. To make them a little bit rougher on the edges. Since it's balsa, it's really effortless to do to get kind of an effect that looks kind of like that just chewed up all right and I'm just gonna finish I just do this whole stack and uh, go from there So it's about 24 hours later, and now I've got my uh, my uh, spackle is dry. I'm just going to texture it with a little bit of drywall joint compound here. It's it's very similar to the spackle, but it's got a little bit more rough texture to it. And I'm going to make sure I get this on the entire surface of the sides. I'm not going to worry about the flat surfaces on top because I have something else planned for those. I'm going to use end up coming in with my texture paste later and doing those. But this will give it a nice plastery kind of stone look. And I'll be putting this on a lot thinner so this won't take nearly as long to dry as the spackle did. Actually going to do this part while the rest of this is drying. We've got our brown texture paste here, which has separated slightly, so I need to mix it up a little bit. Just the water uh, coming to the surface of it, and it looks like I'm running out here, so I'm going to have to make some more of this at some point. I'm just going to mix this up. I might have to add a little bit more water to it. I'm going to take some of my putty knife tools here and start kind of spreading this around on all of the horizontal surfaces. And I'm not really going to care too much whether, whether it mixes in with the, the white stuff or not. I'm just going to let it do, I'm just going to let it do that and then I'll paint over it some more after. I 
I'm doing this all at once too because this is all going to need to dry. It's going to take some time, probably about a day, maybe a day and a half for it to dry all the way. And I want to make sure that I give it as much time as I can before I move on to the next steps. This stuff can be messy, especially if you let it dry, but if you need to, you can scrape it up with a, a razor blade or a paint scraper. And then you can just wet the surface with some water and uh, wipe it up and it'll come off. Uh, everything except cloth. I don't, it'll, you probably have to wash cloth in order to get it off. Like put it in the washing machine. And you'll see on some of the surfaces that I've done already that the water rises to the surface. It's perfectly normal. It's supposed to do that. In fact, it's gonna help us in the next step when we give this a little bit more texture. Okay, I want to add some rocks to this while it's still wet. And I've just got some garden stone that I got from the dollar store here. And I'm just going to add these in random places to give it a little bit of uh, variation. Mostly around the bases here, but I'll put a couple in, in the open too to add like rock features. Looking at this now, and I'm realizing I forgot to do the top up here with my texture paste, so I'll come back in with that. So you can see how it looks wetter than when I put it on. So now I want to find a, a, my a ratty brush, and I just have this, and it, I use the only I only use this brush for this, and it's just so worn and flared. And uh, what I do is I just come in and stipple. Tap down the brush lightly to give the surface some evenness and texture. You notice too that the water starts coming back up again and it starts smoothing it off. That's going to evaporate and it's not going to make it smooth. It's going to look nice when it's done. So now I just have to wait. This is going to take about 24 hours to dry. So. I'm going to leave this overnight while I go to work, and in the morning, tomorrow, we should be ready to move forward with our project. Okay, so we've returned to the project a little bit later than I would have liked. I had some things that I had to take care of in my private life, but we're back to the project, and everything's dry, rocks are solid, they're glued down. We're ready to go. So one of the I wanted to try something new with this, uh, you know, brave on experimentation and all that. Uh, when I did my dragon video, it was the first time I had ever tried a zenithal priming, and I'm going to do something similar here. I'm going to try to paint the vertical surfaces with gray primer, and then try to come down with the brown on top of it. That was kind of a cool rhyme. I didn't even mean to, and see how everything works out. Uh, so I've just got more, more of my Rust-Oleum primer that I'm going to throw on this, and if it ends up sucking, I'll just cover the whole thing in brown. So let's see what happens. Now we'll wait for it to dry. All right, so I'm gonna do some dry brushing now. I'm gonna come over the top of this with some different colors here. I'm going to start by dry brushing the rock and stone and then dry brushing the dirt. Oh, actually, I can't do that yet. I have to paint these rocks first. So we're gonna take our dark gray Midish size brush. And we're just going to go over these rocks. Rocks painted, and I think I'm going to take the same gray now 
and dry brush the sides of my hills here. Try to crisp everything up a little bit. looking rock uh, color here. So we're going to switch out now. We're going to do a little bit of a lighter gray. dirt using a I have a desert color here that I'm gonna use desert sand you could use a khaki for this too it's roughly the same color I just this has a little bit more of a yellow to it and I like it a little bit better for doing the, the top coat here going on just a little too thick a little too dark it's supposed to should be just very faint I don't want to rob that dark brown from my final product. Okay. That's the end of the base coat for the under, uh, for the, the base. The next thing I want to do before I go on, I have um, the plan of putting a you know a rope bridge between these two points. Uh, I need to. I have these dowels that I'm going to use. Actually, these are shorter. I use these scraps. Um, I need to measure this. I'm going to take one of my little boards that we made to see how far apart I need to make them. I'm going to take my scribe here. I'm going to use a different tool. I have this tool here I'll use. And I'm basically going to put two poles on either side. So I'm going to do one here. I'm just going to poke a hole straight down. All right. And then I'm going to come over here. A little bit of a different spot on this one. Okay. Now... I think I want to have them be about yay high off the top. I'm going to mark it with my pencil here. So it's about an inch. And I'm gonna need about that much to make it strong. So I'm gonna cut four of these. And now for that last inch up the top, I wanna to carve away at it a little bit and make it look like rough hewn timber as best I can. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, so I had tried to use some Agrax Earth Shade on this wood to kind of keep the grain pattern and make it look a little natural, but that didn't really work out to my liking, so I'm going to just Go ahead and just paint it. Oh, here, I'll use regular brown. That'll work, that'll look better. Differentiate it slightly from the, the ground color.
Okay, this is one of my favorite parts of terrain building. I love doing the flocking. Um, here I have my uh, glue mixture, which is pretty much just distilled water, uh, Elmer's glue, and a little bit of dish soap, like a drop or two, um, just for this whole little jar that I've got here. And it's a 50-50 mix of glue and water. So one-to-one -one ratio of glue and water, and then a couple drops of dish soap, and that's it. And that's all I use. And, um, I use a combination of a dropper brush and an old brushy uh, paintbrush to apply them depending on the situation, depending on where I need the flock to go. So um, I don't want to cover the entire surface, but I want this to be grassy. This was The idea of this was to be like a grassy kind of uh, scene, not so much rocky. So this stuff is really all under undercoat. The first thing I'm going to do is come in here with a little bit of glue and fill in the gap around this post. So I'm going to try to get some grass in there to fill up that gap. And this helps me control just exactly where this stuff goes. You just have to watch out for air bubbles. And uh, you let it find its, its uh, level, which it's easy to do with all this um, texture paste that I put on here, which is another reason why I do that, because it gives the ground a natural sort of unevenness, which is what I like. And um, as mentioned earlier in the video, I am running out of that texture paste, which means it's Time to make a batch, and I've had questions before how I made it, so I'm going to perhaps do a, uh, a video on how I make my texture paste. But right now I'm concentrating on using the dropper to get glue in between the rocks, because I don't want to get glue on the rocks. I don't want to get grass on top of these rocks. I want these to protrude from the, the grass layer itself. I don't want to put it on too thick. See, this is pooling way too much, so I'm going to pull some of it over here. It's okay if you put a bunch. It just it takes longer to dry when you do it that way. It's better to use less in this case, and then go over the top of it later with more in order to fix it in place. Whenever I see a bubble, I'm just going back with the dropper here, and I'm just sucking the bubbles up, and that gets rid of them. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to my brush, and I'm going to dab it around, being careful to leave some dry, because there should be some sparsity to it. It's not perfect, it's a little grassier than usual, I'm not doing a, a dead field here, it's going to be full of life, not so much dead. I'm not trying to do uh, necessarily a grimdark thing here like I usually do. The brush helps control the amount, I think, a little better than the dropper does for the larger areas. Like I said, it tends to pool more. I'm gonna keep this a little bit more towards the edges and have kind of like a path in the middle here. I don't wanna have uh, too much on there. I had some runoff, I had some get away from me down the side there. I want to wipe that up before I put the grass on or it'll stick all over it. Okay, so now I'm going to come in and I'm going to use two different colors of grass to do this with. I've got, both are Woodland Scenics, which I like a lot. Uh, I've got a blended turf, which is a green, and I've got a fine turf, which is burnt. And that kind of gives me a more natural range of coloring and, and um, it's a similar blend, again, to stuff I've seen other people use, and it's the only blend I've used, so if you use a different blend that you like, go for it. I'm going to use this out of a container, but I have to find one first. I'll just jump up, dump a bunch in there, because I like to control it with my fingers a little more. It might be a little quicker to use it with the, the shaker right out of the bottle, but... And now this will just absorb right into the glue. and adhere to the surface. It's my thinking, and I don't know how nature is entirely, but so I haven't really studied this theory I'm about to say so much, but I would think that in the sun, the rocks get hotter, and sometimes the grass around it might burn, but that's just how I, maybe I'm thinking of it in my head and how I want it to look, so if you have a different notion, go with that. 
Okay, and I believe that's enough for our green grass. Just recollect the excess. And now I'm gonna attack it with my burnt grass. And this is a much finer turf. This is gonna stick in all that glue spot a lot better than the other grass did. So using the blended turf and then putting the burnt turf on top of it makes it look a lot more natural. And I noticed um, the model railroad guys do that a lot, use the multicolored turf a lot in their craft. Now I've left this stuff on this board a lot longer than I usually would, but that's all right. It's gonna come out fine anyway. I have a feeling it's gonna, this is gonna look really nice when it's done. This is the part of the process when I start believing in what I'm doing. Because up until this point, I had no idea how good this was gonna turn out. It could have it could have been crap or not. It's kind of like uh, the principle of recording music, garbage in, garbage out, or doing anything really. If you put in no effort, you get nothing in return. If you put in a lot of effort, you don't always get everything in return, but at least you get satisfaction that you tried your best. And um, for this, Doing it the way that I did, I think was the way to go about it. Okay. So it absorbed a little bit more than I'd like, so the grass is gonna be a little bit thicker than I would've liked, but we're gonna leave it. And I'm happy with that. That looks good to me. So, we're gonna set this aside to dry, and we're gonna work on our, <laughs> and we're gonna work on our bridge. Easier said than done, folks. All right, I'm gonna clean up, and we'll get back and work on the bridge. So, uh, after some sleep and a little bit of research, I decided to try something different for the bridge. Uh, I decided that the craft string that I was gonna use just wasn't gonna be thick enough to work with how I wanted to work with it really, and I didn't think it would hold up with the glue and everything. Um, one of the things that I would completely forgotten that I had done a while ago was I was just playing around and I had made a rope bridge already. Uh, this one just happens to be a little bit too long, but you can see it's made out of uh, this same elastic cordage, which gives it some play, and it's just glued together using uh, PVA glue. I'm gonna try to do something similar with this. This one's actually coming apart a little bit, but, uh, and this was made with coffee stirrers as opposed to balsa wood. Um, I'm gonna try to achieve a similar effect to this with uh, the whipping and and everything like that on the ends. So I have a couple of things that I want to try here. Um, obviously, first of all, it's going to be just it's going to be shorter, but only by just a little bit. Um, I had originally measured out 12 inches, and I was like, oh yeah, 12 inches. That's what that'll be good, and we'll round up and we'll do a lot of wrapping. And I don't, I don't want that. I, I I don't. That's a little bit too much work now that I'm thinking about it. Um, so we have here we have this piece of eight inch cordage, uh, elastic cordage, you get it in the, uh, I got this in the sewing section of Walmart, I think, and it has a, a good strength to it, has good stretch. Um, first thing I want to do is make sure that my ends are sealed so they don't fray, so I just kiss them with a little bit of uh, flame. It might stink a little bit because there's an elastic band in there, but don't, you know, don't melt it, just touch it to seal the, I'm going to break out my double-sided tape. We're gonna lay down two strips on our cutting mat. And this will make our string stay down when it comes time to do our gluing. But I wanna do the whipping first, and that's taking the, the ends and securing them. There's an, the easiest way that I've found to do this is with super glue. Which is a lot easier, uh, which is a lot harder than it sounds actually. Sometimes you get the super glue stuck to your fingers and it's no fun for anyone, so. But this really will hold it uh, pretty strong. You just have to wait 10 or 15 seconds for the super glue to set. There we go, now I have one of the loops. Repeat on the other side. Super glue will hold this really well, but we are gonna do one more thing to this to make sure that it stays. Okay, so I wanna get in really close on this um, to show you what it is that I did. I came in with some of the craft string and I did a whipping around this bite. This is, uh, the basic technique is, you wanna take your, whatever you're whipping with and create another bite. Again, B-I-G-H-T. Essentially just a, a loop, a, an open loop in the cordage that you're using. And um, if the camera will cooperate with the blurriness here, you wanna have one end here sticking up, that's the end that we're gonna use to close this after. 
but I want to have this basically this central section here laid over where I want it whipped and I want the end of the bite the actual bite itself sticking out beyond the end here and I'm just gonna pinch it at the end here to hold it so we're gonna go from here and now we'll wrap this way I'm doing three wraps I think that's enough there's there's not much need more need for that now we're gonna take the end that we're wrapping after we go around one more time and stick it up through the bite keeping everything together and we'll pull on this other end and kind of cinch it pull it slide it down a little and pull it tight tight you don't want to pull too hard on this end because you'll pull it all the way back through and you'll just unravel the whole thing so now that we have that we just come in and we trim these ends off and there you have it it's all whipped up all right we got one more I'll do that, and when we get back, I think we'll be ready to start assembling our bridge. Okay, now before I assemble these, I want to, I want to dye my ropes. Because when I go paint them after and put the glue on, if you put the glue on and then you try to do this step, the glue will prevent the dye from coloring what it is you're trying to dye. So, um, I'm going to take these and just dunk them in my Skeleton Horde contrast paint. Um, I would use Agrax, I would use Null Oil, they're too, I think they're too dark, this is more of a sepia. If I had the Seraphim Sepia, that would probably be what I would use, but I don't, and I had a Sepia Game Ink, and I just went to check it, but it's out, it's empty. So I need to get some more of that. Um, so I'm just gonna dunk these real quick in my contrast paint and dab off the excess and use them like a wash. That will give them a neat little uh, old rope look. As you can see there, what happened to it. You can tell the, the difference between the two now, how they look. This is gonna look really good. I, I'm not gonna complain about this. I think this will work just fine. I wish I, again, I wish I wasn't using my contrast paint for this. This contrast paint's a little too expensive to use on stuff like this, in my opinion, but it's a little bit of waste here. But since I don't have anything else and I wanna get the project done for you guys, this is what we're left with. Those need to sit for a moment to dry before we move on. Okay, so now I'm gonna do something similar to the ropes, but with my, uh, the planks that I've built. I don't really know how many of these I need, um, but I know that I, they need to dry before I can glue them. So I'm going to just take a pair of tweezers here, just give them a quick dunk and a shake in the contrast paint. And I'm going to do it not only in the contrast paint, but I'm going to also hit these with the, the uh, Agrax because I think uh, having the, you know, the variance in color might make it look more realistic. I don't know. We're going to try it real quick and see how it looks because that contrast paint looks pretty good for the, as far as this wood is concerned. Weathered it quite nicely in one step, so let's try the Agrax and see how that looks. Oh, I like that actually a lot better. That actually looks a lot nicer. I broke my paint pot, so it won't stay open. Um, yes, I'm going to use the Agrax Earthshade instead. I think that looks a little better and it's a little bit more of a contrast to the other colors I've been using. So I'm going to put those off to the side and use those for something else another time. I'm gonna use the Agrax. I think that looks a lot better. And I'm just gonna get all of these dyed and tapped off, and then we'll go from there. This balsa wood is taking this uh, shade. Oh, see, we got a spillage. No bueno. We have emergency cleanup on aisle four. That's what we're gonna use our dropper for. Well, I already spilled it. I might as well use it. Just dump these in here like this then. And not give a crap about my damn fingers. Let's get messy, folks. Might as well dye a bunch of these, sop some of this stuff up. Might be able to find a use for them later. Let's use this disaster to our advantage and learn not to take the little plastic nubs off of the ends of our Games Workshop paints so that we don't end up in this situation again. Because that was what I did, like a dum-dum. 
I wouldn't have had to use my paintbrush to hold it. I'm not going to bother trying to sop up the rest of that. It's just too much work. Alright, so I'm going to dab these. Not like dab dab, you know, I like dabs, but with a paper towel. And that will get rid of the excess. Now those just need to dry for a little bit. Actually, maybe they don't. Maybe that's all right. That worked out really well, folks. Despite that little spillage, dyeing all these tiny pieces just using a wash that ended up working like a stain. Now, if I want, I can dry brush these a little bit to give them a little bit more of a weathered look. And if I had in the beginning, I'm thinking too, if in the beginning when I had made these, if I had taken my long strip of balsa wood and hit it with my wire brush, I could have given it some deeper grooves and the wash would have gone into those grooves a little bit more. So um, that's something to definitely keep in mind for the future. That's something that I will definitely think about for the next time I do something like this. But we should have enough planks here to do exactly what we want to do with our bridge now. All right, I am deciding to use some super glue gel on this instead of my white PVA glue. I feel like this might hold together a little better for some reason. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna try it and see what we get, and hopefully we won't have too much separation or anything like that. I'm going to put the gel on the ropes. That way we get exactly what we need for width because I don't want to have my planks end up being glued in such a way that they're going to uh, make the rope vary too much. I just don't want to risk having anything pull apart, at least not not for a few play sessions anyway. I'd like to not have to repair something the minute I bring it out on the table. So, um, And if you want to use inches, you could do every like every three planks is an inch. So you could use that for the for the movement. Or in the case of my terrain, most of, most of the time, I don't bother with um, inch movement, uh, grid movement. I should say I just use um, I just use a, a ruler, which for me works very well. And I'm not put. I'm trying. I'm purposely not putting these on straight. Some of them are a little bit uh, left or right or something like that, or varied in their widths across. And one of the things that just popped into my head that I'm curious about. I didn't think about doing any broken ones, so I think I'm gonna break a couple of these. Some of them all the way, maybe some of them not. I think that that would look cool. And with whole ones on either side of it, I'm not worried about it twisting too much or anything like that. If anybody picks or plays with any of these things that you make anyway, there's a pretty good chance that they're gonna break if they're small. Now, unlike most times when I work with super glue, I'll try to manipulate stuff right away. I wanna let this sit and cure almost completely before messing with it. I don't want to touch it. I want to leave it right like it is. I want the glue to soak into the wood and into the the fabric on the out, outer sheath of the elastic cord. I want it to hold. I don't want to have to come back and fix this thing tomorrow, like right after making it. I just don't. All right, so I think that that's good enough for our rope bridge. I'm gonna let it dry. Then we'll bring it over to the other piece and see what it looks like completed.
Hey everybody, thank you for watching. Glad you stuck around to check it out. Um, this month, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody who's tuned to the channel. Thank you to everybody who's uh, joined over on Patreon, the followers on Instagram, Twitter, everybody who has, uh, you know, uh, watched my videos, who has even, you know, just you know, clicked through and not stuck around. I hope you come back. I hope you check it out. I hope I make something in the future that earns your uh, subscription to me and not just because of the numbers, but because uh, when you get the subscription, you get to see, you know, everything that I make, you get notified when I put out new content and stuff like that. And then you can come interact with me and, um, you know, offer up advice and things like that, which I'm mostly open to, you know, if you're not a dick about it, I don't mind listening to what you have to say about what it is that I'm doing. And, you know, I can learn something from you and perhaps you can learn something from me and we can make this all, uh, a better hobby altogether and together our contributions can make it better. So um, I just wanna say a special thank you to my patrons, to my minions over on Patreon. Uh, without you guys, all this stuff would would diminish. I wouldn't have any of the cool things that I get to play with that enable me to make the stuff like you see it, uh, saw in today's video. There was a lot of materials that went into making that and it's because of the generous support of my patrons that I'm able to afford these things. Um, you know, every once in a while I can go splurge on some nice or stuff, not just the stuff that I can afford on my own with my own pay from my job. So if you'd like to help out the channel and you'd like to continue to grow, uh, testing out new and better materials, that's my goal. I've seen other uh, creators that have the same goal and I said, well, it's better than saying, you know, I want a new camera or I want a new this and it's, a, no, you guys contribute to the channel and you know, every red dime that goes into it, except for I think once or twice I use some of it for uh, for gas money, but that helped too. So that helps the, that helps the, mas the master. Um, you know, but all of it almost, except for that one time, everything that you see here in part was paid for by my patrons at least. Uh, the camera that I'm filming on now was in part paid for by patrons the, the the model that I built it, you get the idea I keep touching my face I'm sorry I'm itchy uh, if it's if you like what I'm doing please hit the like button below subscribe all that leave a comment love to hear from you and if something that I've made has inspired you to make something of your own share it I have an Instagram hashtag that I've been using just hashtag the dungeon master and I'll see it and anybody who follows that hashtag will see it post it there uh, you don't have to become a member of my patreon to post on the community page I would like that but you don't have to if you po make something post it over on Instagram I'll see it and I would you know give you a thumbs up for for that and it would make me feel you know great as a creator so um, I've been your friendly neighborhood dungeon master and this is yet another big build and stick around we got more to come take care